deal with the fourth message today, or I should say the fourth stage. Today's message is the fourth stage, called, is what we're dealing with. In Romans chapter 8, we're going to look at verses 28 through 30. But I think Marcel might be sneaking uh, a quotation of the day in on us. I'm not sure yet. I see his head down. There it is. I knew it. I knew he was doing it. Thomas Aquinas. To one who has faith, no explanation is necessary. To one without faith, no explanation is possible. Mm -hmm. That's good. Profound. Yeah. That's good to one who has faith, no explanation is necessary. To one without faith, no explanation is possible. Mercy. That was good one, Marcel. Thank you. Bro. <laughs> <laughs> Amen. Let's see if we can build your faith so that you won't need an explanation. <laughs> Romans 8 and 28. Actually, Romans 8 verses 28 through 30. If you would, stand with me when you find that passage and uh, follow along as we read together. All right. New King James Version. It says, And we know that all things work together for good to those who love God, to those who are the called according to his purpose. For whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom he predestined, these he also called. They would say called. called. He also called. Whom he called, these he also justified. And whom he justified, these he also glorified. But verse 30 is what we're looking at. Moreover, whom he predestined, these he also called. Yeah. Let's pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you for today's message. I thank you for your anointing to teach and preach with clarity. And I thank you for allowing me to be your vessel to be used today. I pray that it's your voice that's heard and not mine. And Holy Spirit, I pray that you would take these words and plant them deep into our hearts that we would be doers of your word and not just hearers only. And we thank you for the, the grace and blessing that, that's brought to us by the obedience of your word. So we give you praise for it. We ask, Holy Spirit, that you would confirm it with the appropriate signs we want us to follow. We give you praise for it all. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. All right, you may be seated. <coughs> now, we've been dealing with God's plan for our lives. We've been dealing with how he's worked out some things before we, we got here, some things before time began. And uh, 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 we dealt with the first three up to this point. We know that he chose us, he predestined us, he foreknew us. And uh, uh, these three things so far that we dealt with in that order have to do with eternity. Eternity. Uh, he did those things before time began. So that brings us to the fourth stage of God's plan. And I pray that, that as you... you uh, <coughs> Uh, uh, build on this with me that it, it becomes something so entrenched in your spirit that, that sometimes what happens is you're unaware that you need it and then when the time comes you realize how how, how useful it is you, you discover how stable you are as a Christian and uh, uh, I don't know about you but I've experienced this in my, my own walk with God is that uh, like I said when I go through these these series or whenever I'm teaching on these these messages they uh, I hear it twice See, because I'm giving it to you. I also got it to begin with. But as I give it to you, the Lord speaks to me uh, a second time or a third. Depends on how many times I give it. He keeps building on it for me. But it doesn't seem to be, a, uh, or I say, it's not apparent that it's useful until the time comes. And what I discover is, is I'm, I'm that sound Christian that's able to speak into someone else's life to bring stability to them. In other words, I'm discipling others, or I might be witnessing to someone else, and uh, uh, it leaves me in a position to where I'm like Marcel's uh, quotation of the day said, because you have faith, you don't need any explanations. You see, you're walking by your faith, and you're living by your faith, and others who are stumbling around, whether they be baby Christians or those who are just investigating Christianity, uh, you tend to have that, that draw or that, that light that, that tends to draw people into the kingdom. You see, you have it, and you can share it. And as you do, of course, you become more established in your faith. And that's my, my goal, is to get you established in your faith so that you'll be a balanced Christian, and you'll be able to, to disciple others. Because remember, when you talk about growth, if you're talking about spiritual growth, 
is is parallel to uh, adult or I should say physical growth. You know, I give it three stages. You see, the babyhood stage, uh, which is where you have to be fed. You have the childhood stage, where you can feed yourself. But then you have the adult stage, where you begin to feed others. And that's where we want to go. We want to be to that place or get to that place where we start feeding others. But you have to be fed first. And you also have to learn to feed yourself. So that way, uh, uh, you know, you can tend to other people while you feed yourself. But then as, as time progresses, you end up feeding other people. But where we are now in God's plan, uh, as we grow to be more stable Christians, is the fourth phase or the fourth stage, which is the call stage, the call stage. The first feet, three phases of God's plan for us belong to the realm of eternity. It belongs to the realm of eternity. Uh, what do I mean by eternity? <coughs> I'm going to just visit for a quick minute. In Dr. Richard Eby's book, he passed on to be with the Lord, but he was a, a, a guy who, who uh, experienced heaven uh, before the rapture. I mean, it, it wasn't a grand, glorious thing that happened to him. It was actually a tragic thing that took place in his life. Uh, uh, he was a botanist uh, by profession. And, uh, uh, but at this time, and see, that, that plays into to his experience. God allowed him to have this experience because of his, his career. It made him more uh, descriptive in what he saw when he went to heaven. But how did he get to heaven? I'm glad you asked. Uh, one day he was doing some work on his house. He was on the second floor. And uh, he was carrying a box of tools with him. And uh, in carrying these tools, they were heavy. Uh, he stepped on a piece of board that was rotted out and didn't know it. And he crashed through the board with these tools in hand. So because he was carrying the tools, he went head first to the ground. When he hit the concrete, his head, this is his testimony, his head uh, basically split open and his brains and blood came out uh, on the concrete. Before, he could, before the ambulance could get there, all of his blood had drained out of his body. Uh, so he was basically dead on arrival. Uh, but his description of what happened to him, he had no idea that that's what happened. He fell, but in his description, he landed feet first in paradise. So he landed head first in the physical and the natural, but he landed feet first in paradise. And as he was in, in paradise, he describes everything that he saw. And what I love about the book, if you want to go get the book, is that in his description, unlike a lot of other books that talk about heaven and hell experiences, he has it pretty organized to where everything that he saw, he footnotes it with a passage of scripture or several passages of scripture. So at the end of each chapter of what he saw, you can go through all the scriptures and see those things in the Bible. You see? And that's a good way to get entrenched in the word too by going through this man's experience or encounter. But one of the things that he experienced in heaven was this heavenly music that was just, just the most beautiful thing he had ever heard. But what was different about this music that he made note of was that the music didn't have time to it, didn't have beat to it. It, it, it was just an eternal flow of music. And he noticed that the, the, uh, there was no beat to it. So every time he asked a question in heaven, just like here on earth, when you ask a question, you form it in your, your brain first before it comes out of your mouth. And before it would come out of his mouth, the Lord had already answered it. Now, Isaiah 64 says, before they call on me, I will answer them. Mm -hmm. All right? So now in heaven, there's no hindrances to that. He's thinking of a question, and before he can ask, God answers. And his question was, why is it that the music doesn't have a beat? And the Lord says, because you're no longer in time, you're in eternity. You see that? In eternity, time doesn't exist. Therefore, no beat. You see? So all of us will be on beat. When we get to heaven, if you don't have any rhythm now, you can rest assured, praise God now when you get there, you know, it'll all be fixed then. It'll be fixed. But in the meantime, you know, he's describing what he saw in heaven, what he experienced. And, and he says in eternity, time doesn't exist, therefore no beat. Where everything that God has planned for us, the first three phases of God's plan, they start in eternity, uh, where time doesn't exist. But that, of course, takes us to the fourth one. See, he foreknew us. These are the three. He foreknew us. That's an eternity. He chose us. That's an eternity. He predestined us. That's also from or out of eternity. So what's the significance of the first three? They all were complete before time began. But make note of this. The fourth phase, which is what we're dealing with today, the called us phase, 
is different from the first three. How, are they, how is it different? <coughs> well, God's plan emerged out of eternity and now goes into time. Into time. So I have your first of two PowerPoints I'm going to give you today. Uh, the first one. When each of us were called, God made his first impact in our individual lives. Amen, that's right. When each one of us were called, God made his first impact in our individual lives. See, now we're getting down to where the rubber meets the road. We've been talking about some things that's been more conceptual than, than practical. But, but uh, as we go into time, this is where we can relate now. Because, see, God has created time, and he created time for mankind. He's, and he put us in time, you see. And since he put us in time, the time that he created, that really means that the time we have, it, it should be used wisely. See, all we have is time to fulfill our purpose. If we're doing anything other than fulfilling our purpose, then we're wasting our time. You see? We're wasting our time, and, and time is our most valuable asset. See, when each one of us were called, God made his first impact in our individual li lives. But here's a warning that goes with that. See, the moment when God calls you or me is the most critical moment of our lives. It's the most critical moment of our lives. Now, why is that? It's because our future is decided by our response to his call. You see? Our future is decided by our response to his call. Let me give you an example of that uh, using my own call to uh, help illustrate the point. You know, uh, I've been noticing now as time progresses since I've been in the ministry that I have a lot of experience to pull, pull from and, and, you know, you can't just give it all at once. But the Lord tends to give you the ones that, that, that are needed most. And I do recall the time when I was called uh, by God. And uh, uh, I, I received Jesus when I was a kid at seven years old. I received and came up and you know, got baptized and things like that. Uh, I got to actually know him in college uh, through a friend of mine who I've shared with you before. He was the... He was the uh, uh, well, I could say he was my spiritual dad in the faith. A classmate of mine was really, really uh, intelligent, very smart, an uh, honor student. And I needed help, you know, to get some things done in our class. And he was the one that, that actually led me into a more intimate relationship with the Lord at that time. I like to say that's when I really came to know him. But I got baptized. I was identified with him uh, at seven years old. Uh, let me throw this out at you. When I say I was identified with him, I was identified meaning that, that baptism identified me with the Lord. I, I responded to the invitation to be saved at seven and got marked in my salvation through that baptism. And just like any sheep, you know, you don't ever find, if you notice, you don't find any wild sheep. Anybody go wild sheep hunting? <laughs> <laughs> Oh, you don't do that. You know, I thought about going cow hunting before. You may be an easy prey. You know, I'm not a good shot. You know what I mean? But, but if you're doing that, you, you're probably shooting somebody's property. Yeah. You know what I mean? <laughs> and, uh, uh, that's a criminal offense. Because, uh, see, when you see a sheep off by himself, he's wandered away from home. And when Jesus told the parable of the lost sheep, you know, he says that he'll leave the 99 to go find the one. He's not just looking for any old sheep on the hill. He's looking for his own sheep. And how does he know his sheep from any other sheep? It has his mark on it. A brand or something like that. When you belong to God, you have his mark on you. You see, Baptism would be the mark of God on you. If you ever stray away, just like a sheep, he'll leave the 99 to go find you. It might be in a bar or a crack house or wherever. You know, uh, but but once he finds you, that's home to the sheep. Keep that in mind. P.S. He goes back to the flock. See, some people find home outside in the streets, and they get they they get, they they have a personal relationship with the Lord. But that doesn't necessarily mean that they start going to church immediately. They got to get to know the shepherd for a little while. You remember the, the story I told you about the shepherd when he when Jesus is walking around with the little lamb around his neck. It's such a, an endearing little picture. When you see Jesus walk with his lamb around his neck, but it's actually pretty brutal when you think about how they have to tend to the sheep. 
And remember, he has to break the lamb's leg if he wanders off too many times. He breaks the lamb's leg and resets it. Then he carries him around his neck and hand feeds him. That makes the sheep or lamb more independent on the shepherd. You see, how many of you could be more independent or more dependent upon the shepherd? Do that. Yeah, but you don't want your legs broken. No. So spend more time in the Word than in His presence. You don't have to worry about that. You know, judge yourself so that you don't have to be judged. But in the meantime, if you are a lamb, now I'm talking to lambs, not sheep, the babies, they tend to run off and do their own thing. And when they do, the shepherd will have to go and find them. And he's looking for the one with the mark on it. Well, in this case, at seven years old, I got the mark of God on me, but I got lost somewhere at Langston University, and he found me there. He found me. Now, when he, when he found me and I got to know him on a more personal level, uh, I, I, I didn't get into my Bible yet. I wasn't going to church yet. My grandmother, like I said, I used to live with her. That's where I got the call to preach. That's where I got the call to be a barber. That's also where I met Delaney, who ended up being my wife, staying next door to my grandmother while we went to school at Langston. But uh, I recall this, that at this point in time, you know, Grandma would always say, hey, you going to church with me this morning? And I'd say, uh, no, I'm not going to make it this morning, Grandma. You know, I didn't, didn't have a desire to go to church. You know, and uh, this particular, I, I would do that all the time. But this particular time, you know, I used to work at home now, And uh, uh, I, I managed to get off early one Saturday, where usually I would close on Saturday. So that would be my excuse. Since I close Saturday night, I'm too tired to go to church Sunday morning, so Grandma would give me a pass. This time, though, I didn't close on Saturday. I came in early, got off early, had a lot of daylight left. You know, so I went to Oklahoma City, went to the flea market, bought myself some, some, some goodies from the flea market and all that kind of stuff, but I didn't realize my sleep schedule was off, and uh, I was really tired. I didn't know how tired I was. I was just glad to not have to work. Now I'm driving from Oklahoma City back to Langston. And when I got to Guthrie, the Guthrie exit, uh, uh, or that last Guthrie exit to go into Langston, mm -hmm. I was like, you know, nodding off. I kept nodding off, and, and I was like, well, I'm just a few more miles away. I can get, if I can just get to Langston, I'll be all right. But I nodded off one time too many, and my car went off the road. I woke up just in time, going about 65 miles an hour, to see a stop sign coming right at my, my uh, you know, the front end of my car. Couldn't have, didn't have time enough to turn or anything like that. I just hit it head on. I'm glad I didn't wake up to a Peterbilt, you know what I mean? Right. Of, you know, but it was a stop sign, scary enough. Didn't have my seatbelt on. I hit the stop sign. It was a kind of a ravine, a hill, uh, past that stop sign. Went down that hill with the stop sign wrapped around the front end of my car, and, and it came in and, and tore out the windshield. It broke the windshield. Uh, uh, but I bounced over to the passenger seat. So it came in on the driver's side. Couldn't chop my head off, you know. But I'm going down the hill, and I still remember. <laughs> I remember I was playing my music, and it was a. a Y'all remember a, a, a movie called House Party? Yeah. You see that? I was playing the music to that. that to the House Party, get from there. You know, it was, it was real nice and loud, trying to keep myself awake. And it was playing while I was going down the hill. House Party, I'm jumping all around. You know, and I finally made it to the end, and I'm just in shock that my I just crashed my car. You know, I'm like, man, I never had a wreck before, and I had a bad one. At that, and the car wouldn't start, and I'm still hearing the music. And I'm scared to look in the mirror because I'm thinking that, you know, my, my face might be messed up or something like that, glass everywhere. I was okay a little night. But uh, uh, I, as I started walking down the highway, you know, I saw classmates see me, and they, those, those chumps, you know, they drive by. Hey, I see my wrong walking. They could have stopped and picked me up, you know. <laughs> it, was, it was somebody who lived in the neighborhood who saw me and picked me up. They wondered why was I walking. So I just had a wreck, you know. They said, no, you didn't. I had to show him the car crash down the hill, and I'm walking in glass in my arms. Well, long story short, I don't have a car, and uh, the next day, uh, Grandma was like, you going to church today, son? You know, friends, I know. Well, I guess I will go to church. I'll go to church this Sunday. Uh, didn't have any other excuse, so I walked to church. And uh, uh, I got there just in time for Pastor Kennard to uh, give him, you know, he was like at the crux of his message. And I sat in the back, and everybody was looking at me like, what are you doing in church? You know, I, I, I wasn't a church-going kind of guy, so they knew me from uh, another life. You know, now I'm in church all of a sudden. And uh, I'm sitting in the back, and as I'm sitting in the back, <coughs> I remember Reverend Kennard said, said, God has his ways of bringing you back to himself. He says, uh, you can be on your deathbed, you can be on your sickbed. He says, 
you could fall asleep behind the wheel of your car and, and, and crash down the hill. I'm like, what? <laughs> I thought it was a surveillance camera or something wrong with me. And, and, and he saw what happened to me. I'm, I mean, I'm still bleeding on my arm with a knot on my head from what he just said happened to me a day before. That was the Lord calling me. You see? He had called me at that point. You know, I was already his. I was marked at seven. And uh, he, he introduced me to himself in college at Langston, but then he called me uh, that day when I made it to church. He called me through my pastor. Now, I, I didn't know what to do with that, but what happened was it impacted my heart. I, I, I knew something. It kind of scared me a little bit because he knew where I was. You know what I mean? Uh, it's, it's scary when the all-knowing one knows you, and he knew where I was, but I didn't quite know him yet. So that was a scary thing that, that he knew me. He knew that I was I was uh, in that predicament. He called me. Now here's an important note. If as you know, if as you hear this, what I'm telling you about right now, if you have a sense that God's calling you, if uh, what I'm saying is, is answering something that's on the inside of you right now, that, that's happening right now in your life, then that's the most critical moment in your life as well. See, Pastor Kennard wasn't a teacher, he was a preacher. You know, but I, I, I didn't have the privilege of, of getting further instruction beyond that, so I had to go through some more, uh, uh, I guess you could say, some more encounters with him. But it's good that you have, have me to kind of give you a little more instruction to go, go further. <coughs> because uh, that's the most important time uh, in your life when God has done that, when he's, when he's brought you to himself. Uh, right now in your life, uh, 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 if God is talking to you, this is the most critical moment in your life. I want to give you some instruction on that. See, what you need to do is give careful heed, not just to me, but to the voice of God as he speaks to you. Pay attention to the voice of God as he speaks to you. I didn't know how to pay attention to the voice of God yet. Uh, it wasn't until I got into my word and I got into the Bible that I started paying attention to the voice of God. Now, that was a crisis moment for me. At that time, I was a, as far as my mental or, or emotional state was concerned during that call. I was pretty unstable. Like I said before, I was suicidal at that time. You know, I I'd been been cutting people's hair for a while. I mean, like like bootleg cutting hair. I wasn't official yet. That's what I mean by bootleg. Uh, and and not knowing the Lord, but having a, 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 a I could say a barber's heart. I would listen to everybody's problems as I cut their hair. And in cutting their hair, listening to their problems, I would become a part of their lives. The problem with that, though, was, although I was helping them, I wasn't helping myself. I had my own issues that I had to deal with and didn't know how. You know how to deal with it. So now I have their issues and don't know how to deal with theirs either. And I found out this statistic that uh, uh, the statistics are high uh, as far as suicide is concerned among bartenders and barbers. You know what I'm saying? Uh, I can understand why being in that profession not the bartender, but the barber part. You know, uh, you listen to a lot of people's problems. You listen to a lot of people's issues. Mm -hmm. And if you have compassion, you know, you really feel for them. A week later when they come back for another haircut, man, hey, did, you, did, did that problem get solved in your life? You know, that's what you're wondering about. And I'm like, man, I'm glad you asked. And things like that. Well, no, it didn't. It's getting worse. And you don't know how to deal with it. See, uh, uh, when I got into the Word, I, knew, I, I learned how to cast my care upon Him because He cares for me. Amen. First Peter 5, 7. You see, and now that I know how to cast my care upon him for my own issues, it equipped me to deal with the people who are in, in my barber chair. They can share with me their problems now, and I don't take their problems with me anymore because I cast their problems along with my own to him. You see, to where he can care for them instead. You see, uh, but I can see where God is piecing these things together. He called me to be a barber so that I would have compassion for people, but He equipped me with the Word so that I could equip them as well as take care of myself, you see? So now I'm not depressed anymore, I'm not suicidal anymore, because I now have hope because of the Word, Amen. you see? Amen. But in that present condition at that time, in that state, being down, you know, uh, 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 and being broken, you know, it says that God is close to a broken and contrite heart. You know, I got to a place where I wanted to commit suicide, and uh, I figured that, that this would be my last, last deal. Like, I, I, I lost everything, and and more things started happening. I had to get to a broken down position or point to where I could finally pray, finally talk, you know, finally talk to God 
I thought I was going to go to Langston Lake and tell God a piece of my mind, give him a piece of my mind, and then I was going to take my own life. But that was the best thing I could have done was to give my my uh, give God a piece of my mind. Uh, that was the first time I really prayed because uh, I got there. And, like I said, it was an unrenewed mind talking to God. So it would be just like a sinner talking to God. Now, I I, you wouldn't think I was a saint at that time. I was cussing God out and everything. But he's safe to do that with. You know, he'd rather you vent to him than to vent to somebody else. Yeah. You see, so I'm venting to God, not knowing that I'm 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 a psalmist at that point. I'm giving my heart to God, and, uh, uh, and I'm talking about with tears. I'm not talking about just a little old heart, you know, a little you know, a little recital prayer. I'm talking about something from the heart. And uh, I broke down in tears, and as I broke down in tears, the revelation hit me that God wasn't the the culprit. You know, the revelation hit me that Satan was the one that was doing all this stuff to me. So it made me sorrowful for what I said to God. So, Lord, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to say that to you. You know, uh, I'm just feeling this kind of way. I trust you. I believe in you and things like that. That's when things started turning around for me. Because I, for the first time, started praying to God. But the call happened when I was at, at uh, my grandmother's church. Now, mind you, I didn't go to church regularly even after that. It wasn't until I got into the Word that I came back to church, and, and that's when I told you before, that he said, this young man has a gift, and we're going to be utilizing him every second Sunday. And I started off a member at his church as a preacher. I didn't start off as a regular member. It was kind of odd, but that was another, another story. We'll link all those together at some other point in time. But as you hear his voice, you, know, uh, you want to become more sensi uh, sensitive to his call. You know, that's a critical moment. You want to, you want to make sure that, that you respond the right way uh, when God calls you. You see that? Mm -hmm. Our future is decided by our response to his call. So as we hear his voice uh, uh, and we have a sense that God's calling, uh-oh, we lost sound. Did he grab the other mic? Yeah. Grab this mic real quick. All right, all right. We didn't lose anything, did we? Mm -mm. Okay. See, what we want to do is give careful heed, not just to what I'm saying, but also to the voice of God as he speaks to you. Amen. All right? Take advantage of your Bible studies. Take advantage of the books that you read. Let God talk to you through those things, you know. Uh, get into your word and let God talk to you because what he's going to be doing is sensitizing you to his, his spirit. How do I know the voice of God is when I'm responsible for the written word. How do I know when I hear from him, when he gives me a word? That I need is because I'm, if, I need, if I'm going to know his spoken word, I have to be familiar with his written word. That's right, right. See that? Amen. I have to be more familiar with his written word. So get familiar with his written word, and his voice will become more clearer and distinct to you. See that? Now, note this word. I want to give you some, some, some educational stuff real quick before we, we dismiss. But the word call is somewhat of an old English word. Uh, at least the way it's used in the Bible, the word called, the way it's used in the Bible, is it actually has two meanings that go together. It has two meanings that go together. The definition uh, of call means, number one, to invite, and number two, it means to summons, to invite and to summon. So, so what, what, what's the big deal about that? Well, when you receive an invitation, it means that you're being asked to participate in something nice. When you get an invitation, you ask to participate in something nice. But when you receive a summons, it always represents a mandate. Everyone say a mandate. A mandate. It represents a mandate from an authority. It re represents a mandate from an authority. That's what it means. So what is the calling of God then? The calling of God is actually both an invitation and a summons. So write this down. Here's your second and final PowerPoint. You ready? The call of God is an invitation to all the blessings of God in Jesus Christ and also a summons from the ruler of the universe. I know it's a mouthful, but it's the only one you have left. The call of God is an invitation to all the blessings of God in Jesus Christ and also a summons from the ruler of the universe. Isn't that something? God is imposing blessing on us. But the crazy part is, 
He's imposing blessing on us. For what reason? Because of the alternative. If you won't receive God's blessing, what's left? You see? We looked at it in, 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 in uh, uh, Jonah's life. The last time we talked about this, how things were predestined for Jonah. You know, he had a predestined uh, storm that came, a predestined fish to swallow him. He had a predestined plant to grow over his head to keep him cool in the heat. And he also had a predestined worm to eat the plant away so that he'd be frustrated in the heat so that God could give him a, a life lesson from that. You see, So that just shows you how we are predestined. God has given us some things in our pathway that he's already forethought before we got there to meet us where we are. You see, as we walk with him, he's going to give us some things to confirm that we're walking with him. To let us know we are predestined in it. And if you don't follow his plan, you make your way hard. You do it to yourself. We do it to ourselves. And we don't have to. It's not necessary that we do it. A lot of times when we feel like, like things are going against us, we think that God is against us when actually we're against God. See, the way of the transgressor is hard. Uh, that means that when you do your own thing instead of what God has laid out for you to do, you're making it hard on yourself. Mm -hmm. You see that? That's true. See, the call of God is an invitation to all the blessings of God that's found in Christ Jesus. He wants you to be blessed, but it's also a summons from an authority figure. So you have to respond to that, to that uh, summons. See, so note this, that in all that <coughs> pertains to this matter of calling, God still retains the initiation. You see? He still retains the initiative. I should put it that way. Uh, in other words, he's the one that starts. He initiates it. Philippians 1.6 says that he who began a good work in you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. Uh, and also in, in, in Hebrews 11, you know, he talks about, about him. Um, you know, he starts it. He's the one. He's the author as Hebrews Chapter 12, he's the author and finisher of our faith. But when you say author, that means he started it. He starts your faith and he ends your faith. Now, how does faith end? It, it gives way to sight after a, while, after a while. But he starts it, he initiates it. So he's the initiator of all of it. So in conclusion, our response to his call, it determines all that follows, that's going to follow in the rest of our lives. You see that? Our response is going to determine what follows next. You see? If you believe that God is calling you, I mean, I'm going to invite you to come forward for prayer. Yeah. And I'm going to pray for you. I'm going to lay hands on you so that God can give you the next phase for your life so that you can have the direction that you need. And uh, you don't have to go through the, the hard knocks that I did. Uh, but I can give you my hard knocks so that you can have some easy knocks. <laughs> you know, uh, and, and make it a little easier for you. But I do appreciate what I've been through because now it gives me something to share with you. You know, in 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 so doing, we got to be sensitive to His voice. If you have that sense of call in your life, you can come forward and and I'll pray with you. And uh, uh, it's not just an invitation for that. Remember, an invitation. This is something nice. Uh, I want I want you to come forward for blessing. If you've been experiencing some things in your life that. That haven't been right. I want to. I want to pray for you that it be corrected and things like that. And uh, uh, it's also a summons too. Uh, this is a call that I'm giving. This invitation. It's a summons. If you had to make Jesus the Lord of your life, but you've been coming to church regularly, and you you just haven't made that decision, I want you to come forward and you're going to receive Jesus today. Uh, if you need healing or whatever it is, if you need the filling, the infilling of the Holy Spirit, the baptism of the Holy Spirit, I want to ask that you come forward. And I will pray for you and lay hands on you. And I'm going to pray for you out there who are, who are listening on YouTube, out there in, in social media. Uh, I want to pray for you as well, that God uh, makes himself known to you in the call. That you would be, it would be easy to follow after him. Uh, I'm going to pray. And as I do pray, I'm going to give you an opportunity to come forward for, for, for additional prayer that I would lay hands on you. If you want to have hands laid on you, you don't want to mention what it is that you're having prayer for, just come forward and I'll lay hands on you. And, and you and the Holy Spirit know what's going on. Amen? Yeah. Right, so I'm going to pray. Feel free to come forward as I pray. You don't have to stand still. But Father God, in the name of Jesus, we thank you yeah. for today's message. We thank you for calling us. You, you're the one who initiated it. And we thank you that it has nothing to do with us. It has everything to do with you. 
you predestined us to be conformed into the image of your son. And we thank you for that. That's a high privilege. And we ask that you would make us worthy of that. Your blood has made us worthy. We acknowledge the fact. Uh, Father, you took our place as our substitute. And because of that, we now stand righteous. We stand as the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. And we thank you for that. I pray for those who are, are sensing your call on their lives, Father, that you would open their ears to hear you clearly, that you would cause their hearts to be made sensitive to your voice. And Father, I thank you for, for drawing them, as you did Moses, to the burning bush and the wise men, to the star. We th I ask that you would, you would give them their own personal encounter with you, that you would draw them closer to yourself. And we give you praise for it, Father, in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen.